couple of new songs, and that last one is an old, old song. Did you know that? The Carlton. Carlton. Is that right? Is that what you told me your name? Carlton. 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 Scott. Scott. No, but your last name? Markham. Markham. Well, I was close. Markham. Markham. Well, Scott and his wife. They are here from Iowa. Oh. Cold, cold Iowa. Has anybody been to Iowa? Anybody? Have you been there? I was there. This time of year, I think. Ames. I was Markham said that it was in single digits in, back in Iowa right now. That cold. Rarely gets to single digits in Arizona. <laughs> <clears throat> Great songs, though. Great songs. I would rather have Jesus. You know, I have found in my life sometimes it's a whole lot easier to sing those songs than to really live what, for what I'm saying. And I hope you, you kind of examined your heart this last week that you've come through. Did you prove that to be true? I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world offers. It's important because in your young lives, you've got so much left to live, and the devil's going to come to you on a regular basis and entice you to take something besides Jesus. I mean, Adam and Eve were fooled for just an apple. I'd rather have an apple than obey God. But there's a lot of things that Satan will use to tempt you. Always remember the faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. God wants you to grow. And he will allow the devil to tempt you. That's how you grow. And sometimes we fail the test. And we admit we fail it. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. But those are the steps that, one of the steps that God will use in your life to help you grow. <clears throat> now, we're in a study in, in Philippians, and we've talked about Paul and his intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus that's revealed in this book. And we've titled this series, A Journey from Religion to a Relationship. Religion is dangerous. It was a religious crowd that crucified Jesus, right? Jesus came to save us from two things, sin and religion. And sometimes the latter is more difficult than the first. That was a religious crowd that sent Jesus to the cross. He came to his own, and his own received him not, the Bible says. If there was anyone in the world 2,000 years ago who should have been ready for an intimate relationship with Jehovah God through his son, looking for, expecting the Messiah, it should have been the nation of Israel, right? Should have been them. They should have recognized him. I mean, there were hundreds of Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. They should have been looking, ready, longing, learning about his coming. But they weren't ready. And uh, they didn't just reject him. They pushed him out of this world on the end of the Roman spirit. We don't want him to get rid of him. So <clears throat> beware of religion, young man. Beware of religion. Religion is ceremony, it's ritual, it's uh, rules, regulations. But God wants you to have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> an intimate, an intimate relationship. When I use the word intimate, somebody asked me one time, what does intimate mean? How would you define the word intimate? Anybody want to throw out a definition of the word intimacy? Intimacy. All right, I'll give you one. Into me see. <laughs> into me see. God wants to look into your heart. God wants you to have an intimate, you know, knowing God, an intimate relationship with Him. Did you have that last week? Were there times last week when you just got alone with God and God spoke to you and you opened the Bible and you felt like He was talking to you personally? Let me get uh, it. I do my Bible. It's here. <clears throat> Intimacy. Let me uh, read a verse to you. 
Psalms 139. Listen to what David said. And he had an intimate relationship with God. It shows up in the Psalms. That's why God used him to write so many Psalms. But listen to what he says in Psalm 139. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. Isn't that interesting? I mean, David is saying, put it in another, tra I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll translate that for you in Ron Hart's English. You know my thoughts before I think them. <laughs> he knows what you're going to think before you think it. That's intimate, isn't it? And he loves you, and he has a plan for, for each of your life. In fact, it goes on to say in verse 17 in this psalm, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sands of the seas. And when I wake, I am still with you. Let's just think of that. More than God, thanked it. I think it's in another psalm where David said, Thou art mindful of, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Now mindful, that means his mind is full of you. <laughs> I don't know how many in your intimacy with the Lord, how many times you thought about him last week, or even this morning, how intimate that relationship is. But his mind is full of thoughts about you. Is that good? Makes me feel kind of important. So when we get into the book of Philippians, I'm going to turn to that now. And we've been talking about this journey from religion to relationship. And our outline, there's six studies that we're going to have in this study, and we've already covered three of them, I think. <clears throat> the first one was in chapter one. Paul discovered, discovered that Christ was the purpose of his life. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. Jesus is the person, the purpose of your life. Wow. I'd like to go back and review that again. But then we talked about, uh, the next one I think was Jesus was the pattern of Paul's life. Pattern. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who thought it not something to be grasped at to remain equal with God. To remain equal. In other words, he was equal, right? He, he, he was God. And he was equal in the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he thought it not something to be, to, to be grasped at to remain equal. But he emptied himself, humbled himself, and became obedient. Took on the form of a man and went to the cross and died the cross, death of the cross. Made himself of no reputation, etc., etc. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. So... Let this mind be in you. If you want to have an intimate relationship with God, Jesus is our pattern. Pattern. It's not an upward ascent into, you know, upward mobility, but he descended. Didn't give up his deity, but he gave up his dignity and made himself a man. Humility. That's the pattern God wants in our life. Humility. We're not naturally humble. Did you know that? It is our nature to be proud. We have to be careful. Lord, make me like Jesus. And then, uh, see, last week we talked about the pursuit. Paul discovered that Jesus was his pursuit in life. He said, oh, uh, Paul, where are you headed? What's your goal? What, what are you pursuing in life? Lots of young people, lots of people, they don't have a clue where they're headed and what they're pursuing in life. But God wants to give direction and guidance to your lives. So Paul said, my pursuit is to know him. Oh, that I might know him. I want to know his person. I want to know his power. I want to know his passion. That's my pursuit in life. That's my pursuit in life. This morning we're going to talk about this one. A journey from religion to relationship. The title is... The prize of Paul's life. Let's look at Philippians. I'll read them to you. Philippians chapter 3. Right up your screen. <clears throat> Verses 12 through 14. What was the prize? 
that Paul was reaching for? What's the prize of the Christian life? Could you answer that question? Based on your knowledge of the Bible, what is the prize that we want out of being Christians? There's lots of ways probably to answer it. You might say, eternal life. <laughs> Can you beat that? <laughs> Anybody here want to live forever? Say, I do. <laughs> well, Jesus said, I've come. I think John puts it like this in 1 John chapter 5. And this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. And he that has the son has life eternally. So that's a prize. What a prize. Living forever. Of course, it's important where you live forever. Everybody's going to live forever somewhere, aren't they? <laughs> you know, we all, uh, there, there never was a time you did not exist. Or excuse me, let me get this right. There was a time you did not exist. But there never will be a time you cease to exist. You have an ever-living, never-dying soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere. So that's a prize in itself, eternal life. Wow. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believing in Him should not perish, but have what? I know you know that verse. <laughs> Everlasting life. Ah, what a prize that is. Well, there's other ways we could define prizes, you know. Did you ever want to win the lottery, by the way? You can't win if you don't, you, you, you can't win if you don't play, is that what they say? Uh, a lot of people put a lot of money in trying. That's their prize in life. I want to get rich. But forgiveness, isn't that a great prize? To be forgiven. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The next, after this lesson, is the lesson on peace, which Paul mentions in, 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 in Philippians. But there's all kinds of ways to say, yeah, that's the prize I'm reaching for. Well, Paul tells us that Jesus is the prize of his life, and we're going to see what he means. Let me, let me read this to you. I'm going to start in verse 12 in chapter 3. <clears throat> Not as though I had already attained. Now, that's, that's a statement of humility, isn't it? Paul's been a Christian here. This book was written 52 A.D. Jesus died about 33 A.D. Uh, so he had ascended, going back to heaven about 20 years earlier, we'll say, in that vicinity. And Paul got saved soon after Jesus went back to heaven, I believe, became a believer. And so he's been a Christian maybe 15 or 20 years when he writes the book of Philippians. Not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect. Do you have to be perfect for God to use you? Well, God's certainly using Paul, wasn't he? But he admits it. You, you know, I'm not there yet. I'm still growing. In this life, if you live to be as old as Pastor Ron, <coughs> really old. But if you live to be as old as Pastor Ron, you won't be perfect yet. You understand? You'll always be reaching for that prize, straining to reach that mark of a high calling of God in Christ. He says. Either am I perfect, but I follow after, if that I might apprehend, get a hold of, grab, that for which I am apprehended. In other words, something got a hold of me. Paul says, when I was going down that road to Damascus to gather up those Christians and put them in jail, uh, there was a bright light that shone out, and I heard a voice from heaven, and something grabbed me. Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you persecute. And then he asked another question, what do you want me to do? And he spent the rest of his life Answering those two questions. Who is he? I want to know him. And what does he want me to do? Something got a hold of me. Something apprehended me. Has God got a hold of you? Do you remember when he first spoke to you? And there was that feeling of conviction. And I need to be forgiven. And Jesus, you took my sins on the cross. But I want to believe that. And, 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 and God began to get a hold. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of you. I've been in a church service. We used to have a lot of revivals in our church. We don't have many revivals anymore. Uh, and uh, we would sing a song. It goes something like this. It was on a Monday, somebody touched me. It was on a Monday, somebody touched me. And if you were saved on Monday, you had to stand up in the service and say it. 
And then we say, it was on a Tuesday. If you got saved on a Tuesday, then you stood up and say. Now when we got to Sunday, most of the people, most of the people said, God got a hold of me on a Sunday so because you know that's most of the time people get saved, but it doesn't have to be. It can be any time. It can be at home, it can be at work, it can be with a friend, it can be at any time when God speaks to you. But I don't know. I, I, I remember when I gave my heart to Jesus, and it was in a revival service, and it was on a Sunday night. On a Sunday night, I was 11 years old. I've told you this before. And I sat on the very front row of the church because I was determined I'm going to give my heart to Jesus this Sunday. My pastor's name was Parrot, like the bird, Dr. Parrot, in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And when he got through preaching, he says, now we're going to give an invitation. I just stood up right there and took his hand. He didn't get to finish the piece. Oh, Ronnie, do you want to give your heart to Jesus? Yes, yes, yes. I remember something got a hold of me. Something got a hold of me. And that's what Paul was saying here. I've been apprehended. Now I'm trying to get a hold of everything I can of this person that apprehended me. I want to learn as much about him as I can. I want to grow. Now he's been a Christian a long time. Here he is writing the book of Philippians. What a great book it is. <clears throat> Uh, if that I might apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. In other words, I'm not there yet. I'm still reaching out. I want more. Forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forth unto those things which are before, and I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God's got a prize for you. What are you reaching out for in your life as a, as a believer? It's a high calling from God. It's a calling to the cross, to salvation. It's a calling for purpose and meaning in your life. God's plan for you. And Paul says, I'm pressing for that goal of that prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The world will offer you a lot of prizes. The world will offer you a lot of substitute good things, but nothing can match the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And you need to reach for it. You need to long for it. You need to, to want it. <clears throat> I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. All right, go to the next slide, and let's break this, these verses down a little bit. <clears throat> Great lives really are not complicated. This is just an introduction. <clears throat> some, you can read the biographies of some great people and they were looking for power, they were looking for fame, they were, the prize in their life was money and pleasure and position and popularity. A guy by the name of uh, Brown, he was a poet, but he said, Bobby Brown, years ago, he had a little poem that had these words in it. Pleasure is like the poppies spread. You see the flower, the blooms are shed. Or like the snowfalls in the river, a moment white. Oh, uh, let, me, let me say it poetically. Pleasures are like the poppy spread. They see the flower, the blooms are shed. Seas, that's supposed to be seas. The flower, the blooms are shed. Or like the snowfalls in the river, a moment white, then gone forever. He says pleasure. If that's what you're living for, you'll be gone tomorrow. Money, if that's what you're living for, you're going tomorrow. Power, if that's what you're living for, you're going tomorrow. How do you gain the real prize of life? Paul's prize. His a prize was what he was, was wanting to attain. All right, now let's go to the first point in our, in our outline. A sense, then you need to have a sincere dissatisfaction. The person of God can't use some people. Some people God can't use are the people who say they're satisfied with where they're at. There needs to be a holy dissatisfaction. There is a curse in contentment. Now, Paul says in this book, I have learned to be content. I know that. But if, you know, I could say, 
I am satisfied with, with Jesus. I am satisfied with my salvation. I am satisfied <clears throat> with what uh, God has done for me. But I'm not satisfied with Ron Hart. I'm not there yet. I want to grow. I want to mature in my life as a Christian. And I've been a Christian a long time. But contentment, if you hang up a don't bother sign on your life, leave me alone. It's kind of hard for God to get your attention. How, how do you gain the prize of life? There needs to be a sincere dissatisfaction. Not as though I had already attained. Either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I might apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. If you are satisfied with you, the master probably isn't. Beware of self-satisfaction. There ought to always be this hunger, this desire, this strain, this pressing on, reaching for more of Jesus in your life. Don't hang up that sign. Don't disturb. Did you allow God to disturb you last week? Did he get your attention about anything last week? When you were having your quiet time, you remember how we were taught to study our Bible? You read that passage in your quiet time, and then you ask the question, is there a sin in that passage I need to confess? Is there a blessing in that passage I need to receive? Is there a command in that passage I need to obey? Is there something I need to pass on to someone else? God disturbs us. He wants to disturb us. Don't put up a no disturbance sign in your life. Let God get your attention. There needs to be a sincere dissatisfaction. The great apostle Paul said, I am not, I have not, there's still more for me to know about Jesus. An intimate, an intimate relationship. If you just have religion, it'll just be ritual, rules, regulations, ceremonies, and you'll only have a big, big relationship with the Lord. He wants a relationship. All right, go to point number two. Not only a sincere dissatisfaction, you need to be single-minded. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean you never want to get married. That's not what that means. <clears throat> that means you've got one objective in life. You've got one goal. Uh, this one thing I do, that's what Paul says. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing, I'd be forgetting those things which are behind me, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Reaching, reaching. This one thing. No man can serve two masters. A double-minded man is unstable in all his, his ways, the Bible says. This one thing I do. 1 Corinthians 6.12, Paul said, All things are lawful, but not everything is expedient. You know, I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I can't lose my salvation. There's a lot of things I can do to get by with it. But does it help me? The word, not everything's expedient. We get our word expedition from that word expedient. You know what an expedition is? It's a trap. People are traveling, right? They're going somewhere. An expedition. And they're looking for something. And he says, not everything I allow into my life that occupies my time and my thoughts, it's lawful. You know, I can watch TV as much as I want. I can watch the Super Bowl. I can watch sports. I can watch this movie. Uh, but there might be cussing in it, and there might be sexual activity in that movie. But I can do it. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. There's a lot of things I can do. Some, some, you know, we, we have this ability to rationalize it, 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 about everything. You know, I can take a little alcohol, it won't affect me that much, I like the taste of wine, blah, blah, blah. But is it expeditious? Does it help you on your way as you grow in Christ? 
on the path you're traveling? Or does it hinder you? That's the question you need to ask. I can do all things, Paul said. Hey, there was an argument going on in the church of Corinth about whether to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. Remember that? And maybe you've read about it. Paul says, hey, just meat. Sure, they sacrifice idols, but hey, but on the market, they sell it down at the market after it's been sacrificed to idols. It's just meat, and it's cheaper than any other meat, so you can get it at a bargain price. Go ahead and eat it. But a lot of people said, oh, no, 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 you can't eat meat sacrificed to idols. That, that'd be a sin. And Paul said, no, you can't. But he says, I'm not going to do anything that causes my brother to stumble. If, you, if it causes you to stumble, I'll not do it. We don't have time to pursue that thought completely. But all things are lawful, but not expedient. Does it help me on my way? He says not in, 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 in uh, verses 12 and 13, not as though I had already attained, either would all be perfect, but I follow after it that I might apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to be apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forth unto those things that are before me. I stretch. Go to the next slide. A single desire. The next slide is a strong determination. A strong determination. Now we're talking about winning the prize. Paul said the prize in my life is Jesus. I want to follow him more nearly. I want to love him more dearly. I want to see him more clearly, clearly than ever before. And I, I'm going to press toward that goal in my life. A strong determination. I press, that word press is a strong word in the Greek language. It's something that an athlete would share and say, I'm, I'm, I'm exercising, I'm pressing with every nerve in my body, with every muscle, I'm pressing, reaching. It's so important to me for this prize. Some people have desire, but no determination. Would you say Paul had both desire and determination? His course ran through a prison. He had scars on his back from being beaten. He was shipwrecked at sea. I could go on and on and on. He was left for dead at Lystra. He was stoned, put in prison. In fact, he wrote this book from prison, remember? To a church where the first time he'd ever been in prison was in Philippi. So he wrote to a church where he'd been in prison from a prison. But his determination, he had desire and determination. <laughs> I, uh, I wrote up there, you can tell the size of a Christian by what it takes to make him quit. I've known that over many, many years preaching that it always amazes me how, how easy it is for some church members to just quit. Hey, I haven't seen you at church in a month. Where you been? Uh, So-and-so didn't shake my hand. Pastor didn't shake my hand. They weren't friendly at the church. I quit. Or some other silly reason. They just want to give up. There's lack of determination. Determination, that's a great quality. There needs to be desire. There needs to be, you know, you heard me say this before, that your destination will be determined by your determination to follow your direction, which is based on your decisions, which is based on your desire. <laughs> That's quite a formula, isn't it? Yeah. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So if you start out here, my desire, it's my desire to be like Jesus. You know that song? It's my desire to be like Christ. You can take this world's fame and fortune for, uh, uh, all of its fame, but it's my desire. Okay, it's good desire. Delight thyself in the Lord and give you the desires of your heart. But your desire will affect your decision, and your decision will affect your direction, and your direction will affect your destiny. But built into all of that 
is determination. Determination. Are you really determined? How easy is it for you to go through a week and never have a quiet time? How casual are you in your walk with Jesus? If you want to grow, if you want to reach the goal, if you want to get the prize, there needs to be determination. Determination. When I was a young boy, uh, I still like Western music. And there's two old, old, old Western songs that I grew up with. One of them was called Tumbleweeds, a singing group called the Sons of the Pioneers. Roy Rogers was part of that group. They sang a song, Drifting Along with a Tumbleweed, Tumbleweed. Have many of you ever heard that song? These, these Chinese kids don't know cowboys and westerns. <laughs> uh, but it, it, you know what a tumbleweed is, right? We have them in Arizona. OK, it's just wheat grows up. It's kind of round and that very little roots. And, and when the wind blows late in the, in the fall, it just rips out of the ground and it rolls, rolls, rolls. Tumbleweed. Oh. And the song was about a cowboy just drifting along with a tumbleweed. And that's the way most Christians are. They're just drifting along. There's no direction. Let the wind blow them this way, wind blow them that way. But there's another old cowboy song that I really like called Ghost Riders in the Sky. Never heard that song either. But i got to educate you kids on Western music. <laughs> out. And with, uh, Ghost Riders in the Sky <laughs> uh, is about a, a cowboy that rides his horse and he stops up on a hill somewhere and he sees this herd, a fictitious wild ghost herd of cattle coming. And behind them, he sees these ghost riders that are chasing the, the, the cattle. And the herd goes by him, and I'm not going to tell you the whole song, and the cowboys go by him. And then he hears the cowboy saying, uh, uh, I can't remember what he says. <laughs> but he's talking to the cowboy saying, come and help us catch this devil's herd across these endless skies, you know. And so, that last song kind of gave me purpose in life, and I've been trying to catch the devil's herd for the last 60 years. <laughs> but don't, don't let your life drift. That's the point. It's so easy to just drift, and a week goes by, and you say, wow, seven days, 24 hours a day, and I didn't have much prayer. I didn't read my Bible very much. I, I, it's so easy to miss church one week, and then the next week it's easier to miss church, and then the next week it's even easier. Until a month later, I said, wow, I haven't been to Bible study in a, in, a, in a month. How did that happen? There needs to be a strong determination. Here's another little point. To every man there opened a highway and a low, a low way. The great soul takes the high way, the low soul takes the low. And in between, on the misty flats, the rest, people, drift to and fro. But to every man there opened a highway and a low. And every man decides which way his soul shall go. Every day in your life, God's going to say, this is the way, Jesus, these are the words of Jesus, this is the way, walk you in it. He wants to lead you, he wants to guide you. And every day in your life, there's a little way. That goes with the crowd. Jesus said, broad is the way. Remember that? That leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life eternal. And so that little poem that was written there is a reminder. There's a highway, and there's a long way. And we all must decide each day, am I going to take the highway, or am I going to go the low? If you want to reach the prize in life. All right, go to the last point. <clears throat> go, go clear to the front. Let me repeat them, because I've forgotten them already. Go, go to number one, three, two, one, one more. All right, there needs to be a sincere dissatisfaction. Go to point number two. There needs to be a single desire. This one thing I do. Point number three. There needs to be a strong determination. I press for the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, Christ Jesus. One more point. What's the last one? A steadfast determination. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, reach forth unto the things which are before. I press for the mark prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He kept his eye on the goal. He pressed toward the mark and he didn't look back.
forgetting those things which are behind. I find this more true in, in, in the, the older crowd when I'm teaching older people, adults. So many adults are crippled by something in the past, something that hurt them, something that, uh, that disappointed them, something that, a failure in their own life, and they, that, that will cripple them to go on and reach toward the prize. Let me give you four things that you need to learn to forget. You need to forget, and by the way, forgetting those things which are behind. Do you know how hard it is to drive a car looking through the rear view mirror? Huh? That's a good way to have a wreck, amen? If you don't drive your car looking through the rear view mirror, you'll get in trouble. And many people drive their lives looking through the rear view mirror. They're always looking back. And they, they see, when they look back, past gripes. Don't like the way that guy treated me. And I don't like what they did down at the church. And blah, 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 they're always griping about something. You know, we've met people like that who are always complaining, right? Forget about past gripes. Forget about past grudges. You're carrying a grudge towards somebody? Boyfriend, girlfriend, somebody else at school? You grudge, you know, resentment? <clears throat> Christians don't carry grudges. They don't hang on to gripes. Be careful about past glory. Maybe something really good happened in your life. Well, that was yesterday. God's got another blessing for you tomorrow. Don't live on past glories. Reach for more today. Past guilt. Oh, that'll nail you. you. You know, we all struggle with guilt. Is that right? The Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of something and you feel guilty. You should feel guilty. But God forgives us and cleanses us. So leave it alone. Don't live in the past. Forgetting those things which are behind, he says. Don't look back. Press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And keep an eye on the goal. This one thing I do, I press toward the mark for the promise of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God has a calling in your life. God has a plan for your life. God wants to use you for his glory. Make that the number one objective in your life. Is there a conclusion on this? Is there one more slide? I don't know. <laughs> sure. All right. Uh, I only read this story. I've never been to Switzerland, and I've never seen the Swiss Alps. It's supposed to be Swiss Alps. <laughs> Mountains, A-L-P-S. Uh, but there's a cemetery at the bottom of the Swift Alps where a lot of people who tried to climb, what's the famous mountain in the Swiss Alps? The Matterhorn. Uh, some people die trying to climb that mountain, just like the mountain. What's the tallest mountain in the world? Everest. Everest, yeah. And it, I'm told that at this cemetery, which is at the base of these Swiss Alps, at the base of Matterhorn, Many people have died and been buried there, and there's one guy that was buried there, and on his gravestone, they just simply put, he died climbing. He died climbing. Which implies he just wanted to get a little further up. He didn't want to quit. He wanted to keep moving ahead. He died climbing. In your life as a Christian, don't quit. Don't give up. Say like Paul said, I want to know him. I want to know his person. I want to know his power, the power of his resurrection. I want to be conformed into his likeness. And I want to know his passion. His passion. I want that passion to be in my life to serve the Lord. That's the prize. That was the prize of Paul's life. Pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Determination. In your life. Well, I can't think of anything else I need to share with you guys. <clears throat> Intimacy. Intimacy. Religion, if that's all you got. 
cause you to be satisfied with just showing up on Sunday morning for a Bible study, participating in the Lord's Supper and communion once a month. Rules, ceremonies, ritual, regulations. Don't do this, do that, and you'll feel pretty good about yourself. But God wants more than religion. He wants a relationship with you. That's intimacy. You remember how to define intimacy? Into me. Mercy. He knows your heart. He knows what you're thinking. You can't get away from it. He knows your thoughts even before you're thinking. David says in that 139th Psalm, He knows my ways. My ways. I mean, your ways might be different than mine. Your personality is different than mine. Your gifts and abilities are different than mine. But he knows your ways. He made you. It means your tendencies. He knows where you're most likely to be tempted. And the devil will tempt you different than he tempts me. But God knows, and he wants to help you in that area. Learn to be intimate with Jesus. He's your friend. He loves you. He's in your heart. Can't get any more intimate than that. But he, he wants your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you. But he doesn't just want your body. He wants your mind. Let this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's just, the book of Philippians is just loaded with this truth about an intimate walk in relationship so that Paul could sing in prison. And this letter of Philippians is a letter of joy. Rejoice, he says. He's in jail. And again I say unto you, rejoice. I was moaning a little bit this week. Did you guys know I had surgery this week? Lord, it hurts. It still hurts a little bit. But I, when you get old, you wait. You guys, get, you're going to get old. You're going to have to have some surgeries. Buck up. Right now you're young and you think you will never get old. Let's pray to you. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for not just being at the church when we show up on Sunday to meet you there, but you said that you never leave us or forsake us. You want to come into our heart, and you want to guide us moment by moment, day by day. So, Father, put the desire in our heart, the determination in our lives. press on to reach forward to the, that prize of that intimate relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First of all, I